Good afternoon and welcome to the ARC GAP webinar. We appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to learn more about our program. Before we begin, I'd like to note a few things about how webinar works for those of you who are not familiar. So there is a toolbar on the right side of the page, and if you notice, we have muted all of you. We do have a lot of people on the line this afternoon, so this does help to keep background noise to a minimum. Uh, this is meant to be an interactive experience, however, so if you do have questions, feel free to type them in, and my colleague Alex is here with me, and she will get right back to you with an answer, or we will address it at the end of the presentation for everyone to hear. Looks like we've got some people from all over the country joining us tonight, so welcome everyone. Our presentation should last about 50 minutes, and hopefully by the end you'll have a much better sense of the types of semesters we offer here at ARC. So my name is Margot Brookfield, and I am one of the GAP or one of the directors here at ARC GAP. Uh, just a little bit more about me. I have been with ARC for over seven years now. I started out as a trip leader in 2015, including leading our Latin America and East Africa GAP semester programs before transitioning into the office in January of 2017. Since joining the office, I've had the opportunity to direct a number of our programs, well, nearly all of them at this point. And uh, I used to be a GAP director in the office, and now I um, am doing more just programming and operations here at ARC. But being a part of the GAP semester programs has really been a true passion of mine, and I love experiential education and all that that can offer for students. On the GAP team with me are Emily Rosser, Sierra Durkee, and Alex Morton. So Emily is one of our directors here, and she is in charge of our Southeast Asia, Western Mediterranean, East Africa, and Hawaii GAP semesters. She has led two global gap year programs in Asia, Africa, and Latin America for another GAP company in the past and is really passionate about this growing field. Tiara is another of our directors, and she is in charge of our South America and Pacific Islands GAP semesters. She is a former instructor for our South America program a couple of years ago and also used to direct our summer programs for ARC and transitioned into the GAP team uh, last year. And lastly, Alex is our newest GAP director. She has come to us from the field. She has led more, more programs for us than any other instructor. She's led six GAP semesters. Um, so she brings a wealth of experience in that regard, and now she is directing our Western US, Himalaya, and Central Caribbean programs. We are speaking with you tonight from our headquarters in Bend, Oregon. We moved here about five years ago from our previous location in the Bay Area where we were for nearly 30 years. So this is an inspiring place to work and the outdoor adventurous environment uh, has proved to help us create some pretty incredible trips around the world. We are a mom and pop small family company here so you can reach any of us including our executive director George Hoke simply by calling the office. All right, so a little bit more just about ARC and our history. So. We are entering our 40th summer, technically our 41st year. So our first trips left in the summer of 1983 and were run by our founder, Lisa Halstead. If you'll notice, we do call ourselves ARC. The R comes from the fact that we were originally adventures rolling cross country. But as our company expanded, we did drop the rolling and we were adventures cross country for a number of years up until when I started in 2015. But we did keep the R because ARC sounds better than ACK. <laughs> and people know us as ARC. So basically, in 1983, Lisa organized a small group of students with one other leader and packed a, van full of, um, packed a van full and left New Jersey and drove across the United States to experience the wilderness and national parks of the West and, and what it can happen with team building, group dynamics, and personal growth in this environment. And so since then, our programs have really evolved. We now travel to roughly 22 different countries around the world, all while maintaining the founding themes that have made our program so successful. We have been around for a long time. We've had thousands and thousands of students participate in our programs, uh, trip leaders, office staff, uh, really is a, a, you know, the ARC family as we like to refer to it. So ARC's mission is significant. It is to provide unique, life-changing educational experiences in places rarely visited and situations seldom experienced. So we are going to dig into kind of what this really means to us here at ARC. So in terms of unique, I would say unique and life-changing do go hand in hand. I mean, these all certainly do, but really ARC spends a great deal of time establishing relationships with people and organizations all over the world to enable these experiences for our students. And really the programs are meant to be unlike anything that a teenager has ever experienced before, a gap year student. It is not a tour, it is not a vacation, but rather it's a chance to go places and see things that many people only dream of. So this might mean attending a Maasai wedding in Tanzania or helping out on a Costa Rican farm or taking care of your own elephant while at a sanctuary in Thailand, things of that nature. Um, so it really is meant to be an opportunity for students to burst outside their bubble and their comfort zone and really learn more about who they are 
and who they want to be moving forward in the world. So especially at this crucial gap year age, you know, 18, 19, 20, um, it's really a crucial time for these students. Additionally, our programs are meant to be educational at their core. So there is a great deal of learning that goes into the semesters, which we will discuss in a bit more detail later on in this presentation. But these, these semesters are really about experiencing cultural differences, learning about the struggles you know, of, a, of a region of the world that they're facing, or um, understanding solutions, um, really just gaining a, a deeper understanding of the places that they're traveling to and all the nuances that are a part of that through our global themes that are a part of our educational curriculum, which we will talk about. And then rarely visited and seldom experienced, I think are also two that really <laughs> go hand in hand here. And this also comes back to that uniqueness, just places on the globe that students wouldn't typically find themselves traveling to or seeing. And so these are really critical elements that we take into consideration when we are forming our semesters. And you know, by the end of this experience, we want our students walking right away feeling like, wow, can you believe everything that we've done and everything that we've accomplished here? It's meant to be things that you really wouldn't find as a traveler on your own, a backpacker, or just if you were, you know, on more of a tourist type trip, I mean, these are much meant to be much more deeper, much deeper and more authentic experiences for our students. So for our groups, there are typically eight to 14 students per group, which we find to be a nice, small, intimate group size. And this is important because we do want to make sure that a couple of things here, one, that the group is not so large that anyone is lost in the shuffle, or that our groups are so large that they prove invasive for the communities that we're visiting, which are often you know, small, smaller and more rural communities. So this is your opportunity to have a significant experience when you get to know one another on that more familial level. Um, and it does become instrumental to the overall experience and learning on the program. And I will say for most students, the highlight ultimately ends up being the group in a lot of ways. Uh, so our students range in age from 17 to 20 years old. We found that this is where they're still kind of in the same place in life overall versus students who might be older or just have done a few years of college and might be in a different place in life. Um, so we do keep it to 17 to 20 overall. And in terms of what we're looking for with our students, I would say the biggest thing is that our students really want to be here. Um, so one a really important part of that is that we want students who've chosen this experience for a reason not being you know, sent away or forced to take a gap year and do this program. Um, it is not meant for students who are coming out of a youth at risk environment or who maybe need more mental health support than we are set up to provide. There are really amazing therapeutic programs out there um, that can provide ample support for students, but that is not what we do. Um, so we really want students who are ready for this experience, ready to push outside their comfort zones. And students who want to buy into the program and the experience and all that comes along with it. It is a significant period of time, and we want to make sure that students are here for the right reasons. So that is why we have an application process with a detailed application, two to three reference, outside reference forms, which does include one academic, one character, and a mental health reference as needed for anyone who has seen a therapist or mental health professional in the last four years and then a subsequent interview. And so that is part of how we are vetting our students as well as setting up some of those expectations for what they're going to experience on the program and make sure that they're really ready for what that's going to, to be for them on, on the semester. A little bit more about our instructors. So we do have two instructors on every program. They're typically, I say late 20s to early 30s typically, but usually in the 25 to 30 years old age range. And they do have significant experience, um, whether that be in the regions that they're traveling to, and, and they might have language experience that's relevant, particularly on our Latin America program. They also often are coming in with extensive experience having worked with youth, um, whether that's as a mentor, as a teacher, in an outdoor education environment. Some of them have been Peace Corps volunteers, classroom teachers, um, but really they are passionate, they're motivating, they know how to run safe programs for young adults and how to connect with them in that mentorship role. And they really play a pretty crucial, a very crucial role throughout the semester, serving as those mentors, teachers, big brother, sister, a friend, or even a, a parent or, or disciplinarian when need be. So um, they, they really play a lot of really significant roles for our students during the semesters. We do require them all to have their Wilderness First Responder certification, which is an 80-hour medical training course. Uh, it's just one step below an EMT, and that's in addition to the roughly um, eight days of staff training that they have with us, and then about seven days of gap-specific prep that they go through. So, um, you know, that's well over 20 days of training before they're heading into the field with our students. A little bit more, oh, here's just more information about our instructors. This is our cohort from a couple of years ago, but um, really they're just dynamic, dynamic people 
with a, a proven reputation and experience working for us, working for other companies, and bring a lot to the program. So a little bit more about our partners in country. So we're often asked, how are you able to run safe programs in all of these different regions of the world and in you know, remote or lesser traveled regions of the world? So how do you have those intimate connections? And it is, I feel it's important to note that we have really developed, nurtured and maintained these relationships with our in-country partners over the years, sometimes up to 10, 15, 20 years, depending on the region of the world. And so we, we put a lot of trust in our partners to help us create these dynamic itineraries that are not only going to provide these meaningful experiences for our students, but also that are, are flexible. You know, things are always going to change. And so um, they work with us to find projects that are really going to be impactful, sustainably run on the ground, all of those things. Um, and it is our relationships with our program, with our partners that really make our programs what they are. So they are a crucial piece of this puzzle for us. Within that uh, sort of vein of just questions, I am sure you're all thinking, you know, safety. This is a big question that we're often asked as well. It's just, how can you ensure the safety of my student when they're traveling halfway around the world with people that, you know, you don't know ahead of time, right? So it's, you know, very important things to consider. What if something happens? What infrastructure is in place? So we are very proud of our safety record and do attribute that to our being proactive in the field, to our, instru our instructors hiring really mature, responsible leaders who are required to go through all of this intensive training with us as well as the wilderness first responder so that they can create that safe environment for our students and act appropriately in the case of an emergency. We do have an extensive infrastructure of safety protocols and risk management systems so that if something does occur, we make sure that our students are taken well care of if it is an injury or illness related thing they're taking to, you know, safe um, clinics or hospitals in country. Families are always kept in the loop in those scenarios. We do have an after hours emergency contact if needed, our beeper line um, and set up, you know, we have set communication protocols between the office, the instructors, families, as well as our in-country partners. So a lot of communication would be happening should anything like that arise. Um, on many of our programs, I would say it's mostly traveler sickness is what we see more often than not. But of course, you know, when traveling, things can happen. So we do have a lot of infrastructure in place to assist in those um, scenarios. Okay, so we have a lot of different um, program categories here at ARC. So this is a gap semester webinar. We are going to be talking primarily about our gap year programs, but also worth noting that we do have summer programs for teens from seventh through summer after seventh grade through summer after twelfth grade. So we do have um, those programs available for students. Those are more we have service learning programs and cultural immersion programs, as well as some more educational programs that we call our focus category of summer programs. So there's a few different options there in terms of those offerings. And then we do also have our custom programs for school. That could be, I mean, it's mainly schools, really they're group programs, so they could be for anyone. So we have a couple of different sort of silos within ARC in terms of the various programs that we are offering. But we're really going to dig more into the gap semesters tonight, obviously. So we have fall and spring offerings. They're all 10 week long semester programs. And these are all of the regions that we travel to in the world. So there are a lot of different options here. The blue dots are the, the gap programs, while the green dots are summer. But we're going to go through a little bit more of um, details of each of these programs as we continue through the presentation. But before we begin with all of that information, I think it's important to touch on like what is a gap year? Um, you know, hopefully you're already considering this or have started to do some research. But if you're still in the beginning phases of that, I think it's also important to note what is this gap year option? So it is something that has been pretty common globally for many years and has only recently picked up significantly in the United States, I would say in the past like 10 years or so. And it's meant to be the natural break between high school and college in this, you know, quote unquote, traditional form. I think a gap year could be any time in life. Uh, it's never too late. But as we're going to refer to it, this is that time between high school and college to gain maturity, perspective, awareness, grow your leadership skills, maybe figure out what you want to do in college and beyond before you head into a four-year program or whatever's next for you after high school. It is definitely meant to be an opportunity to unplug from the everyday classroom and reboot in a way that's much more experiential. So everyone can relate to experiential education. Um, it's, it's not just academic in a classroom, but, but really more hands-on than that. Our students gain a better sense of identity, self-confidence, and ability to connect with real-world experiences. So that's really a part of our curriculum and the purpose behind it is that we want to give them those real world experiences where they can dabble in a lot of different things in a hands-on manner. 
and being able to connect readings you had in school or other learnings that you've had and apply them to where you are and what you're doing and then use that going forward. So a lot of our students, it really does inspire their path that they want to follow in college or, or a future career. So within our programs, there is a, a framework composed of five different pillars as we refer to them. So education, project-based learning, cultural immersion, leadership, and adventure. And these really are the foundation and essence of our semesters. So in terms of our educational curriculum, we have six different global themes that students are digging into throughout the course of the program, all through hands-on experiences. So these themes are literacy and education, public health, the movement of people, environment and conservation, indigenous rights and history, and then social justice. So on all of our programs, students are gonna be learning about all of these themes, but as they relate to the region that they're traveling to. So the, the projects that you're doing and the opportunities that you're experiencing are going to vary depending on what region of the world that you are in. So within that, basically you are working with local partners and organizations that are sustainably run, you know, local to the region that you're traveling through. You might be just lending a hand with that project. You might be learning more about the organization. You might have a, a talk from the, the leader of the organization. You might be doing an interview. Um, you might be doing some like research, just learning more. So really digging more deeply into the places that you are through these projects. And um, it's really meant to just enhance that experiential learning. So you have what we call our course reader. It's a piece of this, as you can see, our students are jokingly holding these upside down here. We do have a course reader that's a part of the curriculum where you're going to be reading short articles and snippets about each of the projects that you're doing so that you can have some of that background knowledge and be a little bit more of an educated traveler as you're going through, through the semester. Um, you might also be watching TED Talks or listening to podcasts or documentaries and things like that. And the final piece of our, of our entire curriculum, sort of the culminating piece of that, is the Capstone Passion Project. And that is basically an opportunity for you to pick any you know, topic or theme that is of most interest to you as it relates to the region that you're traveling to. It does not have to be one of the six global themes. And basically you research that throughout the course of the program, ideally not through internet research, but more so through continued observations, interviews, just further immersing yourself in, the, in what you're doing on the ground. And then you give a presentation at the end of the program that can take any creative form that you want. So we've had students in the past do a whole different variety of things for their Capstone Passion Project. We've had, oh gosh, we've had slam poems or board games or cookbooks or um, paintings. I mean, really, we want you to get artistic. It's not meant to be an essay or a PowerPoint. I'm sure you've done your fair share of those in school. But we want you to find something that really interests you, that you're really passionate about, and then have your presentation be something that is exhibiting a, an, a creative interest of yours, you know, kind of taking that any direction that you want um, as you're moving through that. So as I mentioned, these projects are a big piece of this. And so as you look through the itinerary, it might be, you know, this photo in particular was from our solar energy project in Kenya, or it might be, um, you know, working with a, a local organization in Yellowstone that's working on you know, gray wolf and grizzly bear um, conservation and learning more about what they're doing. So there are always organizations that are already established projects. As I mentioned, they're locally driven. Um, and really, it's meant to be a mutually beneficial exchange and where you're learning. Um, so you're getting to be a part of projects and see what communities or organizations are trying to accomplish, lend a hand where appropriate, um, and just really immerse yourself in that to the, to the extent that you're able to during the semester. Cultural immersion is a big piece of our programs that is experienced every day on our semesters. And it's really, you know, hopefully why you're looking to take a gap semester too, is to really experience and immerse yourself in a culture that you are unfamiliar with and broaden your perspectives on this. So on our programs, we do this through homestays. Our international programs do have a number of different homestays, usually two to four homestays throughout the program. We do not have homestays on the domestic semesters. You also might be doing like group community stays, um, or participating in daily traditions and activities throughout the course of a program. And then our leadership development curriculum is a big piece of this as well, where basically you're stepping up into both formal and informal leadership roles throughout the course of the semester. The big one of these is our leader of the week. And this is where you're with a pair with another student and for you know five to seven days or so, you're stepping up into more of a leadership role you're then learning how to give and receive feedback within your group. You're learning about leadership styles. There's sort of a progression where you're, you're building upon that throughout the course of the program, goal setting, things like that. 
And then about two-thirds of the way through the semester, you have what we call our student plan module. And this is usually four to five days where we don't have anything planned. You are given a budget and parameters, and you as a group need to come up with your own plan for what you're going to do for that period of time. Your instructors still travel with you. It's still the group experience, but you're learning more about planning um, how to travel within a budget, how to do, you know, transportation or accommodations and food and activities and such in these regions. So it's a huge learning opportunity for students as well as uh, a teamwork <laughs> initiative to, to figure out how to plan and work together as a team for that. And then lastly, adventure. All of our programs have significant adventure components. Depending on where you are in the world, this will vary, but it might be that you're getting scuba certified or taking surf lessons or uh, whitewater rafting, backpacking, hiking, you know, whatever it may be. But fun is, you know, it is a gap year. You should be having some fun as you're taking this intentional time away from the classroom. So that is a part of our program. Alrighty, so just a brief overview of um, COVID and where we are today with that. So, you know, obviously we've been operating programs now. It is almost three years that we've been operating programs in this COVID environment. And we have been ever, ever changing our protocols and how we're approaching that as we're moving forward. Um, we have been fortunate to be very successful in our ability to run programs during COVID. And given our longstanding history of 40 years of programming, um, you know, we are used to adapting and pivoting and making changes and all of those things, you know, as it, as, as we continue into this next phase of, of life here. So right now, um, basically we are, our protocols are being solidified as it nears each season. So we are still, we are still requiring vaccines of our students and instructors who are participating in our programs. Um, and then other protocols are gonna be sort of dependent on country or region expectations, depending on where it is that you're traveling. But just so you know, for all of our programs, if you put down a deposit for our fall semesters, um, you can only get $300 of that $800 deposit back if you withdraw before June 1st. And then for the spring programs, the same goes, but the deadline is November 1st. So it's only a partial refund. We want to make sure before you're putting a deposit down that you're positive that this is the right fit for you, that you're really excited about ARC, and that you're wanting to move forward with us. So if we, for some reason, have to cancel a program before it begins, um, you know, after that date, then basically you will, we will give you a full refund on any payments made and then allow you to either switch to another program that is running at that time or roll that deposit over to another program in the future if you'd prefer. So yes, just as I mentioned, all of our protocols are being updated as we move forward and um, we are sending those out to families as it gets closer to the program. But, um, you know, those are just changing season to season. Um, and we, we do generally defer to the local regulations as they come up. So if a partner or a project or a community wants us to take a test or wear a mask, we are wanting to be respectful of that and be um, culturally sensitive to what other folks who are hosting us want us to do. All right. So now we are going to jump into just some more fun details about the programs, the highlights. This is going to be really the broad overview. And then if you're wanting more information, I will say our website is a really great op um, option, as well as, you know, jumping on to talk with any of our directors in the office if it's one of their specific programs. So this is a lot of info here. I'm going to go through it very quickly, and then we'll take some time for questions at the end as well. So I'm going to start with our domestic programs. We have two, Hawaii and Western U.S. Hawaii is a fall and spring program, and it does travel to three different islands, the Big Island, Maui, and Oahu. Um, our domestic programs, I think one major note about those is that they are camping-based programs. So students are camping for the duration of the semester. They're, you know, traveling overland. They're learning how to cook for themselves in their groups, kind of splitting up into cook crews, and they're learning how to budget and grocery shop and cook and clean and all of those good skills. Um, this is all front country camping, though. So they're at established campgrounds. They're not backpacking into the wilderness and um, camping in what's called back country for the duration of the program. So just some highlights here, sur you know, surfing lessons on Oahu's North Shore and a habitat restoration project. Um, this has been a really great local nonprofit that we work with to preserve the nesting grounds for the lace, um, lace and albatross on the North Shore of Oahu. So removing invasive plants, outplanting natives that birds use in their nests, and protecting the area from predators. And then also just learning about the behind the scenes workings of an environmental NGO. Um, so super cool organization that we're working with there. And then surf lessons, not only on Oahu's North Shore, but you actually do surf lessons on all three islands. So um, exciting to kind of have that consistency to build upon those skills as you move through the program. 
Next up is our food security project. There's actually a couple of different projects that touch on this during the program, but um, one of those is you're doing some permaculture and sustainable farming on the program. Um, while also doing a, a sort of workshop at University of Hawaii Maui College, where students are digging more into aquaponics, permaculture, vermiculture. Um, so really learning about that through an established place there. So I would say also on this program, really just learning about sustainability, especially in an island environment. You know, it's like you're, they're very, it's very secluded in terms of the food system. So how does that work um, in a sustainable way? And what are some efforts being made in that regard on the program? Next up is Volcanoes National Park Service and Mauna Kea. So on, for this section of the program, students are on the big island of Hawaii, there's Volcanoes National Park, and students are working in the park with a local organization that is working to remove invasive ginger species in the park and learning about the importance of removal of invasive species. And then they're also getting to learn just more about the volcanic history of the islands. So, um, you know, learning about there is still lava flows uh, you know it isn't there are active volcanoes um on the big island and so just kind of learning more about that if lucky maybe seeing that spot where the you know there's still lava flowing and it meets the ocean but they also get to go up Mauna Kea which is the largest peak in the world if you take it from the seafloor to the <laughs> to the peak there is snow on it at certain times of year so um you know catching a sunset from Mauna Kea and then last up is our ancient fish pond restoration this is where students are going to be working with a local foundation to restore and maintain an ancient fish pond that once served as a sustainable source of protein for the community. Um, and then just otherwise, students are really getting to dig into Hawaiian culture, take part in traditional cooking and blessing ceremonies, um, and really learn about this very unique culture um, throughout the program and kind of honoring that history while there as well. Last up, students get to do a manta ray snorkel. Um, so a nighttime snorkel with the manta rays, I think they throw food in the water, they bring them in, um, or it's a place where they t they generally gather. And then students are also going to get their scuba diving certification. So um, it's about a four-day PADI scuba cert. Um, there is some online e-learning that students do before for any of our scuba courses. They have now switched a lot of that to be kind of coursework you do ahead of time, and then you do more of your practical skills once you're there with them. Um, but you still spend a few days getting to go out, do various dives. And on any of our programs for students who are already scuba certified, you can get your advanced open water, which is pretty fun. All right, next up is our Western U.S. program. This is a fall-only semester, and students are traveling to Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and Hawaii. So a lot of ground is covered on this program. Um, so we're going to go through some of the highlights here. First up is students are going to head into the Jackson area of Wyoming, where Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone National Park are roughly located in this region or not too far from each other. So students do get to spend some time in the Tetons. It's often in the beginning of the program. They're doing some of their orientation, um, just hiking and exploring in the Tetons in Jackson, and also learning about some nuances of small mountain towns and kind of what's happening um, politically and environmentally in these regions. And then students do get to venture into Yellowstone National Park, where we partner with an awesome organization that does grizzly, wolf, and bison studies and education for students and conservation work. So you're getting up at like four or five in the morning, heading into the park, seeing the animals at their most active time of day, and really just learning more about the threats and barriers to conservation of each of these animals in this region. Next up, we have our Wolf Sanctuary and Wilderness First Responder Certification. So this is actually pretty cool. This is now our only program that does this, where you can get the same certification that your instructors have um, that is often a sort of prerequisite for working within this outdoor education field as a whole. So students do get to get that, you know, 80-hour wilderness first responder certification, learning backcountry medical uh, information, just also good good to know info if you're venturing into the, into the wilderness at all or like to recreate in the outdoors. And then students also get to work at a really awesome sanctuary in um, Colorado where they're learning about wolf conservation. And this is actually so in, in contrast to the project in Yellowstone where you're seeing wolves in the wild, here they're in a sanctuary. They've been rescued and, and are not really fit to be totally self-sufficient in the wild at this point in time. So um, learning about conservation of wolves from a different lens here, which is a really unique contrast. Next up, students are going to so many different national parks across Utah and Arizona. Um, really getting to just dig into the themes too of like preservation of public lands in our country and what does that really mean and the history of those those national parks and how they came to be and who was implicated in that in that process as well. 
Um, so visiting, you know, there's so many different national parks in Utah, Arches, Zion, Canyonlands. Um, so kind of visiting a lot of those iconic places up the West throughout the course of the program, um, doing some hiking and exploration. Next up, students are doing a multi-day rafting trip on Cataract Canyon. Um, so that's where they're packing up into, into rafts as seen here. You're getting to sleep on the banks of the river. Multi-day rafting trips are one of my favorite things. It's super fun. And they also get to learn about sort of water rights issues in the Southwest and, and how those are implicating local communities. And then we have a really awesome um, project that students are working on. It's like eco-building projects for tiny homes. Um, so not only looking at housing sustainability, but also sustainable ways of building homes. Um, and then they also get to visit Bears Ears National Monument. Next up, we have our immigration project on, in, on the southern border in Arizona, where students are going to actually get to work with an organization that is working with immigrants and refugees and um, just need a, a deeper understanding of the immigration issue here in the United States and, and what does that actually look like in this part of the country. Um, many of us have been so far removed from that and only hear about it on the news, so really impactful project for students to really learn more about this experience for, for immigrants trying to come to the United States. And then last up, students do finish this program in Hawaii as well, on the big island of Hawaii, where they do a, a similar project to the Hawaii Gap program in Volcanoes National Park, doing invasive species removal um, and learning more about that volcanic history of the island, and then also getting their scuba certification while there as well. All right, now on to our international program. So Central Caribbean, we're going to start with, and um, this program is a fall and spring program. So um, it does run both semesters, and it travels to Costa Rica, Panama, and Belize. So there is a Spanish language school. Both of our Latin America programs have language classes. This is the only more formal classroom portion of any of our programs. But because Spanish is spoken throughout each of these programs, it's an important foundation to have for students to further immerse and engage in the culture and learn more about that throughout the course of the program. So they usually have about five days of language classes here in Costa Rica while with homestay families. So they get to go home at the end of the night and really practice their language skills with their host families. And then they also have a ranch day with a community, um, a farmer that we've been working with for, I think, over 20 years now we've been staying at this ranch. And so students also get to kind of immerse in the family there in the community, um, learn more about sustainability and farming and ranching. Um, he has all kinds of projects going on here, greenhouses, native tree, you know, reforestation. Uh, he has a fish pond, um, animals, the whole shebang. So really getting to dig into that there in the highlands of Costa Rica. Next up, we have our sea turtle conservation, or um, both of these are sea turtle projects. Basically, if it's fall or spring, it depends if this project is done in Costa Rica or Belize. They are slightly different, but um, so in the fall, it would be in Costa Rica, and that is where it's a really awesome organization that's looking at all of really sea turtles on the coast of Costa Rica. Students get to patrol the beaches at night looking for nesting sea turtles, work in the hatchery, potentially release hatchlings into the ocean, which is pretty incredible. And then in the spring, it's just a different um, turtle population uh, in Belize that they'd be working with. And then they're also looking at chocolate um, and cacao farming in Belize as well. So just slightly different projects. Next up, we have the Monte Verde Cloud Forest um, project where students are basically working at the Monte Verde Institute in Costa Rica. And they're learning more about various sustainability efforts that are being made in Costa Rica um, for the environment. So a really unique project there. Um, and then a couple of fun pieces too. Students are going to get to take surf lessons on Costa Rica's coast, um, getting some, catching some of the beginner waves, and then they also get to go on an overnight rafting trip on the Papari River in Costa Rica, which is super fun. Next up in Panama, we do have our um, community health initiative in Boca del Toro. So this is a really amazing project that students get to kind of partner with and really just learn more about. So. They, this is a, an organization that is dedicated to providing medical care through pop-up health clinics to remote communities in the Bocas del Toro um, Island archipelago because they don't often have access to healthcare here. So students are learning a little bit more about the importance of healthcare for these rural communities. Um, they're really just kind of shadowing, assisting maybe with the check-in process at the clinic. They're obviously not doing anything more than that. They are not trained medical professionals, but um, just a really cool hands-on project to learn more about uh, healthcare in this region in a, in a hands-on way. 
Next up in Belize, we have our marine project and scuba diving certification. So this is where students are getting to go out to a private remote island and uh, it's one of the keys off the coast of Belize. Really amazing, beautiful location. And they're getting not only getting their scuba certification here, but they're also getting to learn about um, invasive species removal on the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, which this is the second largest in the world to the Great Barrier Reef. So um, getting their scuba certification, then actually spear fishing lionfish and removing them from the reef and learning more about the importance of this conservation issue. Okay, next up we have our East Africa program. This is a fall only semester and it does travel to Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania and does end in Zanzibar off the coast of Tanzania. Some highlights here are rhino sanctuary and homestay. So this is a rhino sanctuary in Uganda um, that is focusing primarily on the white rhino and really students get to basically, as pictured here, they're shadowing with rangers who are you know, monitoring the rhinos at the sanctuary. So this is an enclosed space, but learning about why poaching has been such a threat to rhino conservation, um, you know, just digging into the issues of conservation in this region, but actually tracking rhinos on foot. It's a really incredible project. Um, and then they also get to go rafting on uh, the Nile River, which is, I would say, maybe one of the most exhilarating day, uh, adventure days I've ever had on a program with ARC, or maybe in my life, super, super fun. Um, and then they also get to do homestays while in Uganda and just dig it more into community life in Uganda and, and culture and history there. Next up, we have a school project where students are working with um, Kenya's first free all girls secondary school, um, like private school. And so students are basically here, they get to take Swahili lessons and sort of start digging into Swahili, which is spoken in Kenya and Tanzania, not so much in Uganda, they speak a different language, but um, you know, English is spoken in this region, but students get to take some Swahili lessons and then they get to shadow a student for a week. One of the girls at this school who has had the opportunity to go to this really incredible educational opportunity and kind of contrast that as well to the public education system in Kenya, um, which is a bit different. Next up, they go on safari in Masai Mara National Park. Um, so students are getting to search for all the major animals that are out uh, in this region, the big five as they're referred to, elephant, cape buffalo, lion, leopard, and rhino, but students are often seeing a whole lot more than just those, of course. And then um, next, uh, and then they get to do their solar energy project in Kenya as well, where basically students are getting to learn about the importance of solar energy, um, you know, a solar energy workshop, like how much solar would I need to power my home back in the United States. And then they are actually getting to build and install solar energy systems into homes that have not had access to electricity before. So um, getting to literally see the process start to finish of someone turning the lights on in their home for the first time, um, while also gaining some really interesting mechanical uh, and electric electrician type skills um, through the help of our partner who is uh, skilled in this realm. We then have another public health project here where students are um, staying at uh, a community campground in Tanzania, which is outside of Arusha, it's a community called Mesarani. And there's a really awesome public health initiative here that is a snake bite clinic. So it is a small clinic. They do all sorts of health care, but they do focus on snake bites and have anti-venom for those. So students get to kind of help out at the clinic, like really just shadowing, learning more, um, again, helping with maybe intake of patients, but otherwise just working with the nurses in their downtime and, and learning more about what it means to um, work in a public health setting in this more rural community. Um, and then they also get to help out in the adult education center. So there is an adult education center here um, for folks who maybe want to learn English or learn computer skills or, um, you know, what, whatever other vocational training they might be doing. And our students get to sort of partner up and, and spend time with them and help them practice their English skills and such. And then lastly, the program finishes on the island of Zanzibar, as I mentioned, is a beautiful island off the coast of Tanzania. Um, absolutely stunning. Students get to tour Stonetown, um, one of the major, the major city there, and learn about the really unique history. Uh, they can take a spice farm tour. Zanzibar is known for its spices. And then just spend time on the beach, sort of wrapping up their time together and finishing out this incredible semester. One other note here about this program is that this is of our international programs, the only one that has a significant camping portion. So students are camping and cooking um, for the duration of this program about, well, maybe 70% of the time. They do have some home stays and some other community stays, but mostly they would be camping. So something to note. All right, next up is our Pacific Islands program. This program is um, 
a fall and spring semester that traveled to Indonesia, so both Sumatra and Bali within Indonesia, as well as Fiji. Some of the highlights here in Sumatra, students get to do a really incredible orangutan conservation project where they are actually trekking through the jungle in one of the national parks in Sumatra and learning about and searching for orangutans with um, trained professional trackers and conservationists, but then also learning about um, palm oil and deforestation and how this major crop is leading to um, kind of the infringement of the habitat for orangutans in the wild. So really digging into that. And then students also get to do a homestay with a rice farming community in Sumatra. So a lot of cultural immersion for sure on this program with some of these homestay opportunities. Next up still in Sumatra is the Lake Toba Immersion Project where students are heading to a different region of Sumatra that has a different um, tribe of people called the Batak tribe and they have different architecture and um, beliefs and culture and all of that. So students are getting to see a different way of life in Sumatra and they do coffee farming. So students are learning about the, as these are coffee beans right here that she's pouring into that. Um, so learning about coffee farming and you know Sumatra is a big producer of coffee. Um, globally. And then they also get to go kayaking on Lake Toba. It's sort of fun activity. Next they head to Bali where students are going to get to do surf lessons here um, as well as explore Ubud which is uh, kind of the cultural and spiritual hub of Bali. They get to go to the traditional water purification ceremony and then in Bali as well. Um, so yes they're just learning more about Balinese culture here. Uh, another major thing there is our social enterprise study within Bali where students are basically getting to visit a number of different social enterprises. Um, you know, they're visiting a women's health clinic. They're visiting a, a place that tries to repurpose trash into, um, you know, pieces of art or they might be visiting, um, you know, there's a food waste place. So there's a bunch of different social enterprises that students are visiting to learn more about social entrepreneurship and how these small businesses are trying to do social and environmental good within Bali. We also have a coral reef restoration project and scuba course that would be happening in Fiji. So um, students are learning more about like coral bleaching, um, doing reef surveys alongside a marine biologist there, um, learning more about the ecosystem, and then they also get to do their PADI scuba certification course while in Fiji as well. So um, a lot of water time on this program uh, given that they're all three islands. Next up, we have our Southeast Asia semester, and this program travels to Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia, and this is a fall and spring program, um, so it does run both semesters as well. Some of the highlights here, students do get to do a Buddhist monastery stay in Thailand and really learn more about Buddhism, meditation, um, mindfulness, you know, kind of do a group stay there and really dig into Buddhism, which is such a big part of, of Thai culture in particular. And then they also get to take Muay Thai lessons, um, which is kind of like Thai boxing. So uh, sort of a fun cultural immersion thing in Thailand while they're there as well. Next up, we do have our Nature Reserve and Elephant Conservation Project. So basically, this is an organization that's sort of an eco-village. They're working on sustainability, living off the land in Thailand. Um, but then they're also working a lot on conservation of animals, in particular elephants. And so they're doing a lot to help reduce the human elephant conflict, as well as help rescue elephants from logging camps, which is often, you know, jungle trekking really um, detrimental to elephants. And so then students do get to visit a nature reserve that has elephants there and, um, you know, learn about the care of the elephants and what they're doing to rehabilitate them after they've been rescued from the um, logging and trekking areas. Next up, uh, similar here, rice is a big crop in this part of the world. Students are getting to stay in a rice farming community and do homestays with a, with a local family. So um, working in the fields, working in the rice paddies, learning more about um, you know, all of the um, traditional ways of farming in this region while also digging into the culture in a homestay. And then lastly, students in Thai, last, last thing in Thailand is students do get to get their paddy scuba certification course on one of the islands off the coast of Thailand. So um, Koh Tao, super beautiful. You kind of take a ferry out there and they get students get to stay on the island while they complete their scuba certification course. Next up, students are going to get to, um, in Vietnam, do a, an education project where they're just, um, you know, partnering up with students at a school and doing English exchange. Um, not necessarily teaching or anything like that, but 
um, you know, kind of shadowing students as they move through that. And uh, we also have an amazing project where students are meeting up with uh, veterans of what's referred to there as the American War or for us the Vietnam War, and just learning more about the history of that war and how it impacted folks in Vietnam, um, since we've often only had the, the American perspective of that potentially in schools and such. And then students also get to go kayaking and exploring in Lon Hob Bay um, as a fun sort of uh, adventure activity. And they also do get to stay overnight on what's called a junk, um, which is basically a, a boat that they stay in overnight and on the bay. In Cambodia, we have our clean water project and Angkor Wat exploration. So the clean water project is basically students are building bio sand water filters that can provide uh, clean drinking water for a community that doesn't have access to that for up to 40 years. So really incredible sustainable projects that um, our partners do there. And then students do also get to visit Angkor Wat, um, incredible, you know, ancient ruins in Cambodia and watch the sunrise over, sunrise over the ruins. All right, next up we have our Himalaya program. Um, so we're going to go a couple of minutes over here. It seems I'm almost done though. So our Himalaya program is going to be a spring only semester next year. It's going to start in spring of 2024. And this program travels to Nepal and India. So in Nepal, students do get to spend some time in Kathmandu, as well as visit um, Bhaktapur, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, get sort of acquainted to Nepalese culture, uh, language, history. They also get to do a homestay here. Um, they get to do some cooking classes, a lot of cultural immersion to start off, um, to staying with a Nepalese family for a few nights and immersing in that way. This is another program where Buddhism is a really big part of the culture in this region. So students do get to do a Buddhist monastery stay um, at a monastic institute. So it's actually young young kids who are learning uh, about Buddhism and how to be a monk um, and you know digging into meditation and such. And then students do get to do a five-day trek um, through the Annapurna circuit in the Nepali Himalayas. So a really amazing opportunity to get out in nature and see this incredible mountain range in the world. We have our snow leopard conservation project, as well as an elephant and sloth bear conservation project. So these are both incredible, um, two different projects. One is in Southern India or kind of Central India, and one is up in Northern India in the Ladakh region up in the mountains. And so for the snow leopards, they're kind of learning about, um, you know, mapping territories of snow leopards and a pro an organization that works with them. I will say it's not, um, snow leopards are very elusive. You will likely not see one. It would be pretty incredible if you did. And then down in southern India, the Elephant and Sloth Bear Conservation is an amazing organization. Students are doing kind of reparation of um, the habitats for the animals, helping out around the sanctuary, learning about conservation, et cetera. Students do also get to do um, some exploration of Delhi, visiting some historical sites, and um, further uh, orientation to India. And they do also get to visit the Taj Mahal. Um, so kind of doing that, the, the triangle, as they call it, um, visiting, you know, Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is, and um, uh, Jaipur and, and Delhi there as well. And then students finish up on the coast of India in Goa, um, doing some surfing, kind of hanging out on the beach, including the program with their capstone projects and wrapping up um, their semester in this region. And then our South America program is um, actually moving forward. This is the final spring we are running it moving forward. This will be a fall only program. And this program does travel to Peru and Patagonia. As a note, um, right now for the spring, we did pivot this program to be Patagonia and then Ecuador and the Galapagos. And that is due to the civil unrest that has been occurring in Peru. So if you have been following along on that at all, that is something that moving forward, we will be um, kind of monitoring for the fall semester and making changes as needed. We are ready to pivot the program to Ecuador um, again, should we need to in the fall. Some major highlights here, if it does travel to Peru, is exploring Machu Picchu, um, you know, ancient Incan ruins in Peru and doing a guided tour there. And then, whoops, and then students do also get to uh, work on an amazing project that's working with llamas in the Andes. So learning about the sustainable use of llamas as pack animals, um, students get to kind of trek into a rural community and understand um, the importance of llamas for the ecosystem here, as well as um, sustainability and preservation of llamas um, in the region. Next up, they would do a homestay on Lake Titicaca, which is the largest high altitude um, 
lake, I think in the world, maybe. It does, it does straddle the border of Peru and Bolivia. Um, and they also have to learn about the Uros people, which is what's pictured here. Basically, these are, a, they were pre-Incan, so the, this is a really ancient civilization that has lived in these floating islands of Totoro reeds on the um, lake. So students do get to do a homestay on the shores of the lake, not on the floating islands. Um, but they also get to go kayaking on Lake Titicaca as well. Uh, the next up is Patagonia. So those are the major projects in Peru. Um, while they are in Patagonia, they do get to go whitewater rafting on the Sudulusu River, which is a really beautiful river in the Lagos region of Patagonia, a little bit further north from where they're sort of based for this section, which is the Ice Benton region of Patagonia. Um, beautiful turquoise waters, absolutely incredible. They're also during this section learning a little bit more about water rights and um, some controversial dams that have been proposed in Chile and in Patagonia in particular and some of the water rights um, and conservation issues that are happening in this region. And then they also get to do a stay on a permaculture farm, uh, learning more about organic farming, sustainability, permaculture as a whole, um, while camping. So there is some camping in Patagonia on this program as well. And <clears throat> they get to, <clears throat> excuse me, visit Parque Patagonia, um, which is Chile's newest national park. Then they head down to the southern region of Patagonia where students are going backpacking in Torres del Paine National Park for a five day, four night trek. Um, but the W track, absolutely stunning and incredible, um, kind of rounding out the program, really getting out there into the wilderness. And then they also get to do an English language exchange at the local high school in Puerto Natales, Chile, where they are in homestays and doing, um, yeah, partnering up with the English department at the local high school and sort of an intercambio language exchange opportunity. And last up, we have our Western Mediterranean program. So this is our newest semester. We're super excited about it. This program does travel to Spain, Portugal, and Morocco. So as some of the um, highlights there, students are getting to study Spanish language while in Spain. Um, so taking, taking actual Spanish language courses and then they also are going to learn Moroccan Arabic. It's called Darija. It's a, a local um, dialect of that. And so students are going to be in homestays while in Rabat, the capital of Morocco, and start learning some of um, Moroccan Arabic. So this program has a lot of different languages that you'll be traveling through, um, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Arabic. <laughs> so kind of just digging into two of those a little bit more. Next up, students are going to do a surf school on the coast of on the southern coast of Spain, um, taking a few days of surf lessons in that region. Um, and then they're also going to get to go um, on a unique overnight excursion into the Sahara Desert. So um, kind of traveling south pretty far in Morocco uh, to, to, yeah, do an overnight in the Sahara, pretty once in a lifetime opportunity. In, back in Spain, there is a sustainable farming um, project that students will be doing where they're learning more, again, just about sustainability. Um, it's an eco-village. It's, it's meant to be sort of a, a totally off-the-grid eco-village, and so learning more um, about their farming practices. And it's also next to the largest greenhouse conglomerate in the entire world. It can actually be seen from space. So students are also learning about kind of the effects of having so many greenhouses concentrated in one area in the Andalusia uh, region of Spain. And then they're also going to do a food waste project in Portugal where we're, they're take, you know, going a lot of um, restaurants basically are donating their food to this organization and they're going around and picking that up at the end of the day to reduce food waste and donating that to houseless folks in um, Porto, Portugal. And then students are also doing a community stay high up in the Atlas Mountains in, um, in Morocco. So they are venturing up into a really remote community and sort of doing a community infrastructure project led by the um, association of the community. And um, yeah, just digging more into, into that cultural immersion piece while in Morocco. And then also working with a really great organization um, that is doing carbon offsetting through the reforestation of native plant species, primarily fruit trees. So they're growing saplings and then donating those to local farmers or having them buy them for a small fee. And then not only is that bringing more, you know, doing carbon offsetting is really good for the environment, but it's also an economic empowerment tool where families then have fruit that they can sell at the local market. All right. I know that's been a lot of me talking here. Thank you for sticking with me, folks. Um, we have had a couple of questions that have come in throughout the course of the presentation, so I'll try to cover those real quickly here and get you all out of here by the end of the, by the top of the hour, I guess. 
Um, so there was a question about the application process and deadlines. So really, we don't have any deadlines here at ARC. It is all based on enrollment and what programs are available. So we do recommend folks to, you know, as soon as you're sure that we are the right fit for you, um, to go ahead and enroll and put down that the application and the deposit for the program. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, basically once that, there's an initial application you can submit through our website in the upper right hand corner of any of our web pages, there is a red enroll now button where you'd submit that. And then the deposit can also be submitted online through that initial application. And then thereafter, we do have that application form, the two to three references and the interview as we discussed earlier. There was a question about food and water. So on program, um, basically for the domestic programs as well as the East Africa program, the students in the group is cooking a lot of that food for themselves. Um, and then on the rest of the programs, all the food is provided locally by our, by our partners. So students are eat, eating the local cuisine and kind of immersing themselves in the culture through that. Otherwise, in terms of water, um, while traveling abroad, you know, it, domestically water is, is potable and provided. Um, while traveling abroad, you know, there's definitely different bacteria present in the water that might make students' stomachs upset. So we do drink purified water throughout the course of the program. Students are purifying a lot of their own water. We are trying to save bottles. We don't want to be purchasing bottled water along the way. So um, students are using scary pens or filters or um, iodine, things like that, to purify their water along the way. All right, there was a question about what do colleges think of the gap year? I do think that's something that has been um, increasingly uh, accepted, if not encouraged, by colleges. They're definitely seeing the benefits of it. If you look at the Gap Year Association's website, they have endless statistics for why a gap year is so important, um, what are those benefits, uh, what are colleges thinking of that. But some schools are, are a little bit more reticent than others, but you can always apply and then ask for a deferral and see if they'll defer your admission. I will say some schools also do spring admission where they admit you for the spring term of that year, and then you can take the fall and do a gap year program as well. So there's a couple of different options there. Let's see, there was a question about if you can speak to references. So we do have alumni references and absolutely 100%. They are by far and away our best resource for you all um, in terms of really understanding what the, what the experience is like on one of our programs. So as you start to hone in on a specific semester, feel free to reach out to the directors in the office and ask if we can put you in touch with a reference. We'd be more than happy to do so and their parents as well. Let's see, there was a question about accommodations. So I mentioned, I know I mentioned that there's camping on on, um, on the domestic as well as the East Africa program. On our other programs, basically it is a mixture of um, hostels or hotels when they're in major city centers, and then it might be like a bunkhouse or basic community lodging when they're in more rural areas. Um, sometimes it's a, a tent or something of that nature, or a home state. So there are a variety of different um, accommodation opportunities on the programs, and I would definitely recommend chatting with uh, the director of whatever program you're looking at to get a better sense for what the accommodations are like on that specific program. And then lastly, there was just a question about sort of like fall or spring. I know I mentioned that we do have both, um, and it really depends on how you're structuring your year. I think that you know, a lot of students kind of opt for the more structured group-based program in the fall of their gap year just because, you know, that's an opportunity to sort of set the tone for their gap year, to get their feet wet in a more structured environment with a group and more support systems in place, um, and then kind of progress, to have it be a progression where you then go on to maybe something different or something more independent in the spring. So, but it really depends on how you're structuring your year. We certainly had students who've done both fall and spring students who've done just one or the other, maybe they work in the fall to save money for a spring program. So really just depends on what it is that you're looking for. Um, all right, and there was one final question just I think about the homestays. So, uh, and how that accommodation works. So basically students would always be with a partner in a homestay, they're never alone. Usually two to three students, I would say per homestay. And um, they're always in the same community as the rest of the group and their instructors. So usually it's just multiple homes and families within the community, all within walking distance of one another usually, or, or close proximity. And the instructors know where, where they are and they can always get a hold of one another should, should anything arise during that time. And then they're usually still doing um, their project or activity together during the day, whatever that might be. So um, they're still coming together, uh, working together during the day, and then usually going home and eating meals with their host families at night and such. Um, and usually they would have their own room. They're not sharing a room with a family member, but they might share a room with the other student that's in their home state. So um, just depending on the accommodations.
All right. So I think those are all of the questions that we've had at this point in time. So I hope this has been helpful and giving you a good sense of our program. So if you would like to learn more, there are a number of ways to do so. You can check out our website. Uh, there are journals, videos, maps, blogs, a whole bunch of information there. As I mentioned, definitely feel free to call the office and ask to speak with a director. Ask us for references. We are always happy to provide those um, as it comes up. So thank you again for participating in, in the webinar. I know how crazy school nights can be. So Alex and I will stay online answering questions for as long as they're still coming in. Um, but, but feel free to, to head out if that's all for now. And if something does come up when we're finished, just feel free to give us a call anytime. Otherwise, we'll hope to see you for one of our upcoming gap semesters. Good evening, everyone.